Hi, thank you so much for joining me in the Louis file today. Today, I'm going to be uh, looking in 2 Peter, the first chapter, the first four verses. Uh, this may be uh, really simple today. Uh, it may not take very long. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, the thought I had about this turned into something much bigger uh, than I intended. So, Anyway, let's just get to it. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Wow. Okay, so this this just got me to thinking. Now, this is the second Peter, and he you know he starts off with an introduction about who he is. He's a bond servant and apostle of Christ. And he, then he, who did he write this to? It says to those who have received a faith just like ours. So they're believers uh, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So this is written by Peter to believers. And he just, he starts right off with grace and peace multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That's pretty great already. But I want really verses three and four is the, the main emphasis here, I think, for me. Seeing, now notice this, seeing that his divine power, God's divine power, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. All right, so God's divine power is the means by which we have uh, access to everything pertaining to life and godliness. And then it says, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. <laughs> so as we have a true knowing, an intimate knowledge of God, his divine power now is given to us and has what it takes pertaining to life and godliness. Anything we need pertaining to life and godliness is now supplied to us through this divine power as we have true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. So there's absolutely nothing wrong on his side of this equation. He has the divine power. He has what it takes for us to live, you know, life and godliness. Uh, our side of this is, is the willingness and the want to, I guess, to have true knowledge of him. And it's, he's calling us by his glory and excellence. So really the knowledge part, our willingness to, to get to know him is, is our side of this equation. So look at verse 4. It says, For by these, <laughs> by these, what? by these, by these what? By this divine power and this true knowledge of him and this glory and excellence. By these, he has granted to us his precious and, his, and magnificent promises. So that by them, those promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. There's so much going on in here. But my main thing about this is the more I thought about it, I thought, so God has divine power. He, he's got, he has divine power, and he has everything in that power that we need for life and godliness uh, and to walk out this thing that he has for us. Everything is, is granted to us through this divine power, but how do we obtain it? How do we get a hold of this divine power? Well, God gives us a promise we by faith say, yes, sir, I believe your word. I believe your promise. The divine power now pours into the promise, into our faith, into us. And now the new divine partaker of his divine nature. So his power is funneled into his promise. Our faith receives that promise full of this divine power. Now we're living according to his 
divine nature. Meaning that by faith, we have escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. The lust that the world uh, injects or that we live in prior to believing the promises is empowering us, if you will, to be lustful for even more. We have this lust for power. We have this greed and this sexual uh, desire and, and overeating and, and wanting to be proud and popular and the best looking and the most wealthy and the most influential. So there, there's, there's a sense where there is a power in that way, a lusting through this corruption in our flesh. But it's saying here that when we, by faith, receive these promises that, that is the means by which this power is poured into us, we get a new nature, we have a new life source that we're living by. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians, he said, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And, and he actually said, let's look back for a second, in Galatians, let me see if I can find it kind of off the cuff here. Galatians, uh, Galatians 5, verse 24 and 25. Galatians 5, 24, 25. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, or lust. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So Paul is saying, look, we gotta, we got to see ourselves that our flesh has been crucified and the passions and lusts that are operating in that flesh, uh, we, we become disconnected to. We're now, according to Peter, we're walking according to this new divine nature. We used to operate according to a different nature. And if you want to see what that is, if you look in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, it tells us uh, that we used to live according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience, and that we were by nature children of wrath. I mean, we all lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Why? Because we were operating according to this nature of this other spirit that was operating in us at that point. So we had a, a, just by nature, we were a child of wrath. We had this angry, unsatisfiable, I don't know, that's not a right, it's not a word, insatiable desire and lust that was operating in our flesh because of this other spirit that's in the children of disobedience. That spirit was, was driving us. Well, of course, it just never ends well. Uh, it always ends and broken homes, broken relationships, sick bodies, addictions, uh, lies, deception, uh, murder, all the awful, nasty, rotten stuff in life comes through this, being operated by this wrong spirit, walking in the wrong nature. So through being born again and receiving these precious and magnificent promises, we now have a new nature we live by, and we can say no to the lust of the flesh, it doesn't mean those, those feelings and those desires don't come up. I mean, it, it says, Galatians 5, I think 16, Paul said that uh, if you walk by the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. He does not say you won't have feelings of the lust of the flesh. You won't have the same pulls and, and, and uh, temptations of the flesh, but he says you won't fulfill them. You won't, you won't join them. You won't consummate them, as James puts it. Temptation comes, lust uh, is conceived, lust uh, joins together with that temptation, and then sin is brought forth, and then, of course, death. So there is an agreement on either side of the equation. As a human being, we have two spiritual uh, kingdoms or realms trying to get our uh, attention, trying to get access to operate in our flesh body. Well, that sounds wild, but that's what I've come to believe that the Bible is telling us. That, and that on both sides, whether it's the dark forces or whether it's God himself, they both require our permission. They need our agreement. So at first, we were deceived, uh, living according to the flesh, just like the rest of the world, um, blind by the, the prince of this world, the God of this world, however you want to put that, blinded by him. So we were doing his will and didn't really even know it. We just thought it was our own. 
when that finally uh, crushes us and uh, disappoints us and, and we, we just have a big wreck in our life, we finally realize, you know what, this isn't working. I got, I got to find a new way. God, if you're there, just show me. I, I'm open to what you're doing. That's all. See, we give him permission. And then we start to understand that, you know, he's promising us much greater things and he's the one with all the real power. So I'm just going to, by faith, take him at his word and then whoosh, this divine nature moves in. And now we have this other entity, this spirit of error, this spirit that was working in us is now working on us from the outside. And it sometimes doesn't seem like it's outside. Sometimes it feels like it's inside, you know, but there's a, it's a short trip from like right here inside to right here on the outside. But the reality is he's on the outside and he's trying to get back in. But the, but the Bible tells us that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So he has no access, he has no permission into our inner man. The inner citadel of our being has been sealed. And, and uh, 1 Corinthians six seventeen says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. It doesn't mean that this other spirit can't bang around in our bodily level and, and get into our head and our emotions. So this is why we have to walk by the Spirit and we have to know who we are in Him. We have to get to know who Jesus Christ is. Oh, and then we're operating as a branch attached to His vine. The power comes into the promise and our faith is attached to that promise and then the fruit will be will bear the fruit. He produces it, we get to bear it. It's astounding. If you only knew how far off from my, what my plan was here, I, I want to just give a quick rundown of some things. You know, this is the way it always works. Uh, God, with this divine power, gives a promise. Somebody, somewhere, by faith, believes him, and then it comes about. I'm going to give you several, just run down quick examples. I'm sure there's many more in the Bible. In Genesis 3.15, God promised Eve a seed that would take out the seed of the serpent. We know that's a foreshadowing of Christ taking out Satan. Genesis 15.1, God promised to Abram that he would be his shield and his reward would be great. And it is and was. Genesis 15.4-7, God promised Abram descendants too numerous to count, stars of the heavens, sand on the seashore. Genesis 15.6, it says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned or counted to him as righteousness. So Abraham became righteous because he attached his faith to God's promise. See that? Divine nature, divine power pumping into Abraham because he just simply believed God's promise. Genesis 17, 19, God promised to Abraham he would have a son, which turned out to be Isaac. That's what, that happened. If you jump ahead in the story, 2 Samuel 7.16, God promised David that his family would never fail to have a man on the throne. In 1 Kings 9.5, God promises Solomon the same thing, said he would establish his throne in Israel forever, which was just carrying on uh, what he had promised to David. In Joshua 1, 1 through 5, God promised Joshua the same thing he had promised Moses and subsequently the children of Israel. It was the land. He said, everywhere the sole of your feet's going to touch is going to be yours. God gave him a promise. Joshua went in. He just believed him. And then in the New Testament, John 14, 16 through 20, Jesus promised his disciples the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that he would be their teacher and their guide and comforter and that he would uh, reveal things to them. The glory of God would become known to them if they just simply believed. And in Hebrews 6, we read where it says that, let me read this, Hebrews 6. I always love these verses. Hebrews 6, verses 13 through 15, says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. <laughs> so, God is saying, look, my promise to you is my word, and that means all and who and what I am, my character, my integrity, my trustworthiness is wrapped up in this promise. Now, isn't that, that's the way it should be, right? You give somebody a promise, 
uh, your name is riding on that. You know, they call it a promise note. You write a check, that, that's promising that person that money's in the bank. Um, you, you sign a contract saying you're going to bring them the car or the, or the property or the deed to the pro whatever. That's your word and that is your, that's you. That's who you are. Your integrity is on that. So the, the power of this promise, the power in the promise is all based on the person giving it, right? So God promised by himself. He said, I swore by myself. In other words, Abraham could blow it. But God was going to be faithful, even if Abraham wasn't. <sighs> That's so good. So God's divine power is made available to us by our faith in his precious and magnificent promises. And by these, we now are partaker of his divine nature. We truly are a brand new creature. We have been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are a new creature in Christ, and, and we live by faith and God's promises. Huh. Maybe that's why they call us believers. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next Louis file.